You're listening to Her Brilliant Health Radio, episode number three. She used to deliver babies, but now she delivers exceptional wellness for women. Welcome to Her Brilliant Health Radio, where holistic women's health expert and board certified OBGYN, Dr. Kieran Dunstan, shares revolutionary insight from leading experts on what you need to know today to treat the root cause of disease, heal, and create the radiant health you've been searching for. everybody. Today on the show, I have with me as my guest, Laura Adler. She is an environmental toxins expert and educator, and I'm going to tell you a little bit more about her. And today we're going to crack the code on exactly how environmental toxins affect your hormones, cause you to gain weight, and have difficulty losing it. Welcome, Laura. Well, I'm happy to be here. Thank you for having me. This <laughs> is um, such an important topic, and I'm happy to share with uh, your listeners. Glad to have you. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about Laura Adler. She's a certified holistic health coach who trains and educates practitioners within the health and wellness community to better understand the links between environmental chemicals and their impact on disease states, from weight gain and diabetes to thyroid disease and infertility, so they can more comprehensively support their clients and patients. Her clients also include health enthusiasts like you who are proactive about protecting their and their family's health and well-being. She takes a practical, real-world approach to dealing with toxins that is informative, accessible, actionable, and free from overwhelm. So glad to have you here today. Thank you, thank you. So my question always that in my mind first is, why does somebody do what they do? Why did you right. become interested in health coaching and toxins? Yeah, so it was actually quite by accident. Um, you know, I was always interested in health and nutrition from when I was in my teens, which is pretty unusual, but I was really turned on in middle school and early high school to vegetarianism and veganism. And that's really what sort of propelled me into the health and nutrition space out of personal interest. Um, but I never really considered doing anything professionally. And in fact, I had a whole other career for eight years in a totally unrelated industry. Um, but I didn't love it. Like it was just like, eh, it was a sales job at a desk in a cubicle under fluorescent lights. Right. And so, um, you know, I, I never let go of my passion for food and nutrition it was sort of what I nerded out on privately. Uh, and then I discovered that health coaching was the thing and that might be an opportunity for me to turn this sort of nerdy passion I had into doing something that was more fulfilling for me. And so I went back to school, got certified, um, started seeing clients and it was actually the weight loss issue that sort of propelled me into the toxin space because most of, I mean, in health coaching, that's often, especially when people are just getting started, that's mostly what people are coming to them for. Mm -hmm. And about... 70% of my clients had like awesome results. They lost a bunch of weight. They kept it off. They felt really great. And I had this other percentage of my people that like nothing was happening, nothing. And I, especially as a new health coach at the time, I was like, oh, what am I missing? What am I missing? I'm doing everything quote right. And so I really started to dive into the research to see what is like, what is the underlying causes behind things like resistant weight loss? And it was through that that I stumbled into this category of chemicals called obesogens. And we can talk about those uh, today because it's a super interesting topic. Mm -hmm. um, and it, I, that sort of opened up the whole conversation into the environmental health space. And it was fascinating, frustrating, infuriating, like learning about all of these things that are used in consumer products and that people don't know. And we're all dealing with chronic health issues chronic health issues are, are just skyrocketing and everybody's kind of singing the same tune, diet and exercise, diet and exercise, eat well, you'll be fine. And no one was talking about our environment and the things that we were being exposed to every day. Um, and because I had just come out of health coaching program, I had hundreds of health coaches that I was connected to and all of them were like, Hmm, 
this is something that I should probably know about if I'm going to be out there working with clients. And so that's really what propelled me into moving into this space of doing all of this research, understanding what these issues are, and then helping practitioners understand them and then also consumers so that they can start making the practical changes in their lives that can have a meaningful impact on the amount of chemicals that they're exposed to with the end goal of, you know, reducing the stress and the burden on their bodies so that they can get better faster. Um, but also with this underlying sort of social mission to encourage and inspire enough individual people in the world to make changes and demand changes so that our industries have no choice but to change in response so that we can in turn force them into making less toxic products so that this isn't a fight that we have to have. So that's sort of the, it was very roundabout, um, but it was, it's since I uh, hit the ground running, it's been nonstop and this conversation has really exploded in the, uh, the public sphere. So it's been wonderful to see more and more people um, open to understanding these issues and they're more alert. I mean, even things like the uh, disaster in, in Flint, Michigan, mm -hmm has really helped put this conversation in the spotlight. And sometimes, unfortunately, it takes a disaster, a tragedy like that in order for us to recognize that this is serious. Yes, and, and I find that most people are just completely oblivious. Um, and like my kids will say, if it was bad for you, they wouldn't let it be that way. <laughs> yes, and that's, and that's such a common um, kind of uh, re reaction or response to hearing about this stuff. And the truth is that that's actually not true. There is no they that's overseeing this, right? So, you know, our, our chemical policy in this country is such that uh, chemicals are not required to be tested for safety prior to coming to market. And so what that means is manufacturers can use whatever chemicals and synthetic materials and ingredients in their products um, they don't have to do testing. They don't have to disclose all the ingredients in some cases. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the end result is that consumers are guinea pigs for these products. And, mm -hmm. you know, the, so the, one of the biggest misconceptions and things that I see, in addition to that, like, well, if it was bad, wouldn't they be protecting us? They, is they. <laughs> they. Yeah, I don't know who they are. Um, is that oh if this stuff was so toxic then why are people not like pouring into emergency rooms which is something that i've actually seen like bloggers write about like an objection and i'm like you know that's actually they're not toxic in the same way that like drinking a bottle of bleach is toxic right they're not acutely toxic and so no the shampoo that you use unless you have a severe immediate reaction isn't going to send you to the emergency room that's not how they're toxic they're toxic on this very low level chronic daily exposure that's just weakening our immune system that's putting stress on our bodies that's slowly turning the tide of our hormones it's not for the most part an immediate chronic reaction and that's where people have this disconnect because they don't they don't see an immediate reaction so they don't take it seriously that it's a problem but when we look at the research and the mountains and mountains of research, we're seeing that so many of these chemicals that we're exposed to every day through our consumer products are linked to just about every single chronic uh, disease and, and health issue that people are experiencing across the board. Yeah, that, that um, kind of temporal uncoupling where you might have it now and it might be 20 years till you see an yes. effect. And then the other issue that I think people really don't understand is the cumulative effect. Nobody's yeah. looking at that. And if you're exposed yeah. to, you know, 200 chemicals in the morning before breakfast, because your deodorant and your makeup and your shampoo and, you know, all the stuff you use, nobody's looking that and seeing the cumulative effect. And then it's 20 And it's years really later. hard to do that. I mean, from a research standpoint, there's yeah. so many variables. Like I understand why they can't really do that. Um, there's been some research looking at the endocrine disrupting chemicals, which are for the most part synthetic estrogens, and we can definitely talk about those. Yeah, we're definitely talk about um, those. But there's some research that's showing, you know, one plus one does not equal two in this equation. So if you have one mm -hmm. endocrine disruptor, it's you know x 
percentage bad or whatever. And the second one, it's not, it's not an equal, the, the together they actually have this um, synergistic effect that can make the, the um, resulting sort of uh, cascade of symptoms actually worse, right? Their effect is actually worse than if they were just counted as individuals. And so mm -hmm. they're amplifying each other. And, mm -hmm. you know, this mix of chemicals that we all have floating around in us, um, you know, is, is referred to as the cocktail effect. Like when we're mixing a whole bunch of stuff, like we actually don't know what that effect is. Um, it's probably not good. Yeah. <laughs> just say that, like, it's probably not good. Um, considering that we know that, you know, exposures to individual chemicals, and that's really how they're tested in, in the uh, clinical research and in the, um, just the research in environmental health, they're tested one chemical at a time. And that's actually true for the ingredients that are in the products that we use. Like a shampoo, mm -hmm. for the most part, isn't tested. It's the individual ingredients are, that are tested and that meet the, you know, FDA limits of whatever, but collectively, they're not being measured in the same way. So, and even the individual ingredients, talk a little bit about that because they'll take kind of a ridiculous amount and then they'll see what's the lethal dose that kills oh, half of the rats. So yeah. it's so unrealistic. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so um, there's a common saying in this space that, you know, and in a lot of spaces too, that like, you know, the dose makes the poison, right? So that, you know, everything is toxic. It's really just dependent upon how much and that the more of something that you take, eat, consume, are exposed to is worse than a small amount. And in some cases, that's absolutely true, right? So radiation, right? A lot of radiation is terrible, right? Can give you cancer. A tiny amount of radiation that you're getting from the dentist once or twice isn't as bad, but cumulatively that builds up, right? So that actually follows this model that the dose makes the poison. And this is the, the absolute foundation, sort of the dogma that exists in the field of toxicology, that they are literally making this assumption that all things follow this same, um, it's called a dose response curve. Mm -hmm. And so that things are having a linear dose response curve so that they are, um, I'll use a little pen here, like that the effect is either straight up and down that way or straight up and down this way and that there's no modification. So in toxicology studies, what you were talking about with that like LD50, let's say you've got a graph, right? And you've got a little axis here and you've got this dose effect. They're testing, and this is like those exposure levels that are like, this is 100 million times higher than what you'd be exposed to in right. a normal everyday. Let's start there. And like, sure, that's going to mess you up. So let's kind of inch down and we'll cut that in half and we'll test here. And then here's where we've got like LD50, right? 50% 50 of the rats die. Let's kind of back it down a little bit because we want something safer. So they get to this place where they see no effect. And so they say, okay, that's good. But they, and then they never test anything lower than that. Mm -hmm. So what happens is they make this assumption that the line continues in the same path. They're just mm -hmm. assuming that based on this concept or this theory of the dose makes the poison. But when it comes to endocrine disrupting chemicals in particular, mm -hmm. there's more and more research that's showing that they don't follow the rules. They don't follow the rules of that linear path. So when we get to those tiny, teeny, tiny doses that normally you'd say like, well, that doesn't matter because it's mm -hmm. so small, the research is actually showing that they have very peculiar uh, uh, graphs or lines on a graph, right? So they can kind of go up like this or wiggly lines. They behave very unpredictably. So what, let's, oh, I'm yeah. sorry, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say is what we're, so in those, in that really low range, right, where people are getting exposed every day to these teeny tiny amounts that researchers are saying in some in, in some fields and particularly toxicology are saying well that doesn't matter because it's so little when it comes to endocrine disrupting chemicals it, it is a big deal because our endocrine system is already biologically designed to respond to these minute levels of hormone in the mm -hmm. body 
So when we go through hormonal changes, we're not going through like, you know, grams and ounces. We're just these tiny parts per million, parts per billion, parts per trillion levels of hormones mm -hmm. in the body that are, and we can, you know, we ever see a child going through puberty, like, you know, we all know what that looks like. Right. And that's a big change um, in, in hormones, but it's a tiny little tweak. And so what the research is showing is the tiny amounts of chemicals that we're being exposed to through our consumer products are bioactive at that level. Um, so we, yeah, let's get into it. So yeah, let's get let's into it. the endocrine okay. disruptors and the estrogens. And, you know, most people listening probably know what hormones are. They know what the endocrine system is, but maybe just talk about that a little bit and exactly where you were going with that. I love that. Yeah. So, you know, the, the, Endocrine system is, I really look at it, it's like this master thermostat, right? And it's like this super finely tuned machine that's working to keep your body in this very specific range of hormones. And it really regulates everything. So it's more than just the obvious things that we think of when we think of hormones, like periods, PMS, uh, menstruation, pregnancy, <laughs> that kind of stuff. It's more... Um, it's more far reaching than that. So mood, energy, metabolism, uh, uh, temperature control, sweating, right? All of these things, our hormones really regulate everything. Mm -hmm. And so what happens with a lot of these chemicals, these synthetic chemicals is they, and I, I don't actually know why this happens, why this is the case, it just seems to be that so many of these synthetic chemicals are synthetic estrogens so they mimic estrogen in the body and when they do that they're essentially they they either mimic or block the role of natural estrogen in the body and so one of the things that i think we're seeing a lot of uh is estrogen dominance and all of the problems that are associated with women and men that are experiencing estrogen dominance i mean the, the sort of joke it's not funny if it's you but like you know the man boobs phenomenon and then a lot of that is associated with estrogen dominance. And so, you know, our body has these hormone receptors um, and we've got, you know, little hormones. I really look at this as a lock and key function. So we've got these like padlocks all over the place and those are hormone receptors. And you've got hormones that kind of float around and will open or close, turn on, turn off different functions in the body that can, you know, start a cascade of, of symptoms, good or bad. And you have these endocrine disrupting chemicals, these synthetic chemicals that can go in and pretend they're masquerading as these keys and floating around and turning things on and turning things off and really mm -hmm. skewing the balance. So, you know, for women that have um, estrogen dependent cancers, right? Breast cancer, mm -hmm. uterine cancer, or things like fibroids or anything. Yeah. So these, um, uh, endocrine disrupting chemicals that will really come in and um, change the 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 profile, let's say, of your hormones. And so, you know, like I was saying, if somebody has an estrogen dominant condition, like uterine fibroids, endometriosis, where there's excess, there's already an issue with excess estrogen, or those conditions are going to be flared up when exposed to estrogen, having these synthetic estrogens is just adding fuel to the fire. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, my aim, and I think the overall aim in learning this stuff is not to freak people out, is to go, oh, okay, well, there's all this extra crap that's coming in that's making me worse. What are the things that I need to do to start avoiding them because I can't mm -hmm. not use shampoo or deodorant, right? Right. So I just want to make sure everybody listening, listen up if this is you, right? Heavy periods, painful periods. No, it is not normal to have pain on your periods. I saw a little it's article so the other day now. where in India now they're, they're legislating to give women off on their periods if they have pain. And it is, we are normalizing disease people by um, saying that that's normal. So if this is you and you have pain on your periods, heavy periods, clots, fibroids, endometriosis, infertility, if you have a weight issue, you probably have an estrogen problem. It is the weight gain, water retention, depression, anxiety, PMS, heavy painful period, endometriosis, fibroid, breast cancer, uterine cancer, 
hormone. So we are going to get into what are these uh, endocrine disruptors that Laura is talking about. Where do you find them? So I want to make sure that you are listening and maybe you have a pen and paper and you're going to write some things down because you're going to learn some things today that are going to help you to stop getting these chemicals in your body and help get them out. So yes, we have dogs and cats here. Yeah. So they're just a part of the picture. I have dogs, she has cats. Um, and so I just want to make sure I, I'm tuning you in to really listen up. So we're going to get into where, where are these? Where are they getting into you from? What are they? Yeah, and I think that like, you know, everything that we just talked about before is really good context for understanding why it's important to make these changes rather than just saying like plastic is bad, right? We need to really understand why. And when we understand why it puts a lot more weight behind the action steps that we're taking. And in such a way that we continue to make those same action steps going forward in time. Um, and I think that's the most important part. And, uh, you know, yes, there's always a certain degree of like, oh my God, and fear and overwhelm, but you don't have to stay in that place right. because there's so many action steps that you can take. And what's amazing is that our bodies are so brilliant at being able mm -hmm. to metabolize many of these chemicals if we give it a chance. So before I get into the specifics, I want to talk a little bit about, um, you know, what, what's happening in our body where we're being exposed to these chemicals in terms of the buildup. So the CDC normally uh, consistently does uh, biomonitoring studies where they're measuring the levels of these same chemicals that we're going to start talking about in the U.S. population. And many of these chemicals like the bisphenol A's and the phthalates, which we'll talk about, are showing up in 98, 99% of people that they survey, that they test. So they're everywhere. They're in all of us. But what's important to recognize is that if given the chance, our bodies can actually metabolize some of these chemicals, that means, you know, pee them out within um, a day, right? 24, 48 hours. The reason why we have consistent 99% levels is that it, the bucket is filling faster than we're able to drain it. Mm -hmm. So if you're using shampoo every single day, if you're using air fresheners, if you're using you know, all of your personal care products that are loaded with a lot of these chemicals, then you're never giving a chance, you're the bucket a chance to drain. And so this is where avoidance techniques are so powerful. So um, you're, you know, uh, Dr. Walter Crinian, right? Are you familiar with his work? Okay, okay so Dr. Walter Crinian um, is a leader in the environmental health space, and he has this five-step approach to dealing with toxins in the body. Step one is avoidance, meaning we avoid them. Step two is avoidance. Step three is avoidance. Step <laughs> four is supplementation. And step five is detoxification. And so he's, it's like, you know, it's a joke, but it's not. He's really emphasizing that the best and fastest way to move towards, quote, detoxing our bodies is through avoidance techniques. And that's why avoidance is what I teach because it's more powerful than anything else. So with that, let's get to where some of these things okay. are and what people can start doing. So, you know, the first thing that I, I typically uh, encourage people to do um, generally across the board, and this doesn't necessarily specifically speak to um, hormones and synthetic estrogens, although it does to some degree, are things like pesticides found in conventional foods. Mm -hmm. So that's one of those low hanging fruit things that we can start to address in our daily lives because we're putting food in our mouth at least three times a day, every day, all, you know, forever. Mm -hmm. And so making sure that that food is the highest quality that we can. And so I always encourage people to sort of live by the environmental working groups, dirty dozen and clean yeah. 15 list. And so the environmental working groups organization that um, really is a leader in this uh, uh, space of, in, of the environment and toxic chemicals. And every year they comb through um, EPA uh, testing data, pesticide data, looking at what are the fruits and vegetables that have the highest residues of pesticides on them. And then the lowest ones, like here are the 15 that are the cleanest, that if you have to, you know, if you're budgeting your grocery budget, like you can buy conventional of the clean 15, but the dirty dozen, the kales, the berries, buy organic versions of those. And so the reason why I tell people that is, 
sure, you've got pesticides that are and uh, neurotoxic and carcinogen, but they're also endocrine disruptors, right? So we want to address those. And um, there's been a number of studies that have looked at what happens to those circulating pesticide levels when people move to a mostly organic diet, not even an exclusively organic diet. And in studies in both children and adults, they found that you can drop the levels of circulating pesticides in your body by 80 to 90% in three to five days. That's all awesome. We, all we need to do is give the bucket an opportunity to drain. And I will put, yeah. I'm going to put a little link in the show notes. I'm going to put all these links that, that Laura's talking about. So I'm going to put a link to the environmental working group so you can download the Dirty Dozen Clean 15 so you all can have it. Because I realize that people are driving and doing things and they can't always take yes. notes. <laughs> so you will have this information in the show notes. So Excellent. yes, go ahead. Excellent. So that's really mm -hmm. the first place that I encourage people to start especially if anybody has children because children are children and pregnant women um, or women in preconception are really the most vulnerable to all of these things that we're being exposed to. So for them, I really say that a mostly organic diet is if possible, a non-negotiable, like you just got to figure out how to make it happen. Um, so can, and so from there, yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say, can you talk about, um, with, you know, sometimes I think berries are on the dirty dozen usually yes. because they don't have anything protecting them. What are some things people can do? Okay. Buy organic if you can, but say you can't do those sprays work that you clean uh, your, your, your strawberries. Yeah. The veggie washes yeah, and things washes. like that. Right. Sometimes, um, mm -hmm. in it, and it's hard to say across the board. So part of the reason why I have to say sometimes is because there's an in a growing class of pesticides that are used that are called systemics and systemics are not sprayed on the crop itself. They're actually injected into the soil. And so they work their way up into the actual plant. So they're not on the plant. They're in it. They're just infused into the body of the of the item so you can't peel it away as you can with some things and finding out which crops use systemics is like more work than most people want to do okay. so for for those for that in the context of that the veggie washes aren't going to do anything right because it's it's the veggie washes are only um de dealing with the exterior of the of the fruit mm -hmm. um you know people can do um vinegar soaks um, the acid in the vinegar, um, and it's like, I think it's like half water, half vinegar. You can just fill your sink up with this and throw everything in. Mm -hmm. I mean, it does actually help, um, uh, keep the food fresher longer because that vinegar is also the, the high acid in that vinegar, is, um, it kills some of the mold and bacteria that can cause your food to spoil faster. So, um, like my sister does that all the time. It's just, she's done it for years, not for the purpose of washing off pesticides initially, but because it helps save money because your stuff doesn't spoil as fast. So you've got like this double one, mm -hmm. two benefit of doing that. Um, it's not going, it will reduce some of the levels of pesticides. It will not completely eliminate them. Okay. So, and is that the same for essential oils? Cause I've heard uh, some people talk about using essential oils uh, to help remove pesticides from fruits. I don't, I don't know. I'd have to look at the research. I've not okay. seen any research to indicate that. There has okay. been a number of studies that look at vinegar washes and veggie washes on the market, and some of them are mm -hmm. like, meh, they work okay, but they're not great. Okay. Um, but anything is better than nothing. So if, you're gonna, if you, if you want to take the extra step to do that, I just always encourage people to do it. Um, I don't think you need to go out and buy fancy veggie washes. I think that's a waste of money because you can just take distilled vinegar uh, white vinegar or cider vinegar, doesn't matter, mm -hmm. in water and, and it's cheaper. Okay. So, um, all right. So the second thing that I uh, really encourage people to start looking at, um, there's really two categories and I'll start with um, the one that's a little bit easier and that's plastics. So a all of us have plastics in our, I'll say this, plastic isn't going anywhere. We all have plastic in our lives. Yeah. We, don't, we can't and don't want to worry about all types of plastics. What we want to worry about are the plastics that are having direct food contact. So the Tupperware 
style containers that we're putting our food in um, uh, primarily. So anything that has food contact. And this includes the um, you know, Ikea plastic drinking cups and plates for kids and all that kind of stuff. We want to really start looking at those things. And the example that I really give to illustrate why plastics are a problem is um, the perpetually stained orange Tupper, or orange stained Tupperware container that everyone has had at some point in their lives that no matter what they do, they can't get it clean, right? It's right. like that orange ring around it. Yeah. And typically because it held pasta sauce or tomato soup and it was hot when you put it into the container and when we're looking at plastics um, the molecules that make up the plastic container the compounds that make up it shed easily right they kind of fall off just on their own but there's a couple of things that increase the uh, likelihood that those molecules are going to fall out including these plastic molecules that are synthetic estrogens um, and that's heat, oil, acidity, and abrasion. And so if you've got hot pasta sauce that's oily and it's acidic because it's tomatoes, it's really gonna flare up this migration of chemicals or molecules from plastic into um, or out of the plastic. And so what happens in those orange stained Tupperwares is the physical barrier between where the plastic stops and the sauce starts gets blurred. and the sauce stain is not on the plastic, it's physically embedded into the molecular structure of the plastic and that's why you can't wash it off because it's not on it, it's in it. And the inverse of that is those plastic molecules are now in your sauce. Lovely. Lovely, right? <laughs> Lovely. So the reason why this is a big concern, so BPA or bisphenol A is the, is the plastic chemical that people, that has the most like street cred, right? People have heard it, you can't go anywhere these days without seeing BPA free stickers right. on everything, right? So people are, even if they don't know what it is, they're kind of like, oh yeah, I've got a BPA free water bottle. And, and a lot of people that are in the uh, um, sort of healthy minded consumer space have them because they thought they were better. Yes, so, I'm holding one right now. Oh yeah, girl. <laughs> so BPA or bisphenol A is uh -huh. a plasticizer chemical that is a synthetic estrogen, mm -hmm. right? So it is one of those endocrine disrupting chemicals that blocks or mimic es mimics estrogen in the body and it releases readily. And it's not found in all plastics, but it's found particularly in polycarbonate plastic, which are the ones that are um, reusable drinking waters, uh, water bottles are made out of, our Vitamix, our food processor bowls, that clear, mm -hmm. hard, shatterproof plastic. Right. Um, and the uproar about BPA really got started when moms found out that BPA is used in baby bottles. Uh, and they were like, uh, no, uh, uh, so they took the manufacturers to task and, um, eventually BPA was banned for use in baby's bottles, not anywhere else, but in baby's bottles. Um, the problem is that manufacturers have simply swapped out bisphenol A for an almost identical chemical in the same family, bisphenol S or bisphenol F. And research is now showing that these two replacement chemicals have, um, are just as bad, if not worse, in their endocrine disrupting effects. So it's like a game of whack-a-mole, right? Where we whack down one <laughs> chemical and another one comes up in its place. And that's, it's just, a, it's, these are referred to as regrettable substitutions, right? We're coming mm -hmm. to regret them as soon as they're made or we'll eventually regret them. And so um, I encourage people to not use BPA-free plastics because they are just as bad as the ones that they sought to replace. And so what I encourage people to do is start eliminating the plastics in their kitchens that have direct contact with food as much as possible, um, primarily focusing on food storage containers and plates and drinking cups and, sink and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and using glass, using stainless steel, um, anything other than, not anything other than plastic, but right. um, really glass and stainless steel are the best options. It's, you can get inexpensive glass storage containers. You know, I've got a, a glass mason jar with a glass drinking straw um, because I don't want to drink. Some yes. Plastic. Also, they- Cheers. Just, yeah. Hey. <laughs> yeah. 
We yes. know what's up. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's a process to go through. And so, you know, a lot of people can feel overwhelmed by like, well, crap, I got a lot of plastic in my kitchen. I can't afford to throw all this stuff out. Mm -hmm. So I always encourage like a triage, right? Let's deal with the plastic food storage containers that you're using for your leftovers first. Then you can and replace those with glass um, jars or glass containers uh, whenever possible. And then start looking at the other types of plastics like the mixing bowls and the pasta strainer and the spatulas and start s systematically phasing those out mm -hmm. and replacing them with stainless steel, with wood, with bamboo um, utensils. These materials for the most part will last far longer, but they're also much safer. So and Laura has yeah. a great um, kitchen makeover program that on her website, lauraadler.com, where she, you, you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So the, well, the kitchen detox program is really, mm -hmm. it's, it's really designed to help people do this. It, I will say that it is, it was developed for practitioners. So it's not um, like for health minded consumers, there might be a little bit mo more information in there than they want or need, but the bones of the course is really designed to help people um, practitioners do this mm -hmm. for other people of help them detox their kitchens. The, the course that I think that it would probably be most useful for your viewers and listeners to check out is called tools for teaching toxicity. It's like a four week, uh, self-paced online program. I've had over 2000 people go through this and it really starts systematically going through pesticides, plastics, cookware, household cleaners, your personal care products to really start understanding what the issues are and mm -hmm. then pointing people towards what are the actionable solutions? What can I do so that I can put this behind me so that I don't have to think about this every day or be worried about it, which is the end goal. So that would probably be the best um, place for people to start if they wanted to check that out. And it's sort okay. of a continuation of this conversation for sure. Um, so definitely start looking at plastics. And then the last sort of low hanging fruit are the fragrances that we're exposed to everywhere around our homes. Um, the, there's a chemical that's used often in fragrances. It's not 100% of the time, but it's, it's predominantly found in the fragrance mixture. So when we're looking at an ingredient label, which we all now know to do for food, we need to start also doing this for non-food items, right? So for personal care products, anything that has an ingredient label, um, we should start reading. And so if you look at your shampoo or your deodorant and you turn it and you skim through like, and most of those words, you're gonna be like, I don't know what these are. And that's totally okay. There's a couple key words to look for. The first one is fragrance or perfume or parfum. Sometimes it's spelled that way. And that word in and of itself is a catch-all phrase that's protected under federal law um, in that companies don't have to tell you what that means. Like what fragrance, what chemicals? Because it could be, you know, a single fragrance can have up to 300 different chemicals in that one word. And they don't have to tell you that because it's a trade secret. It's proprietary. So if we think of things like Clairol Herbal Essences, their whole brand is based on the way the product smells. It's even how they market it. So of course, they're not going to tell anybody how they made that. Mm -hmm. But there's a chemical in there called phthalates that's often used to help the fragrance stick around longer on our hair and our skin. And you're never going to see the word phthalate on a label because it's hidden in the word fragrance, which they don't have to disclose. Mm -hmm. So we just assume that if we see the word fragrance and the company is not specifically saying these plant-based essential oils are part of that fragrance, if they're not saying that, you can assume that phthalates are there. And phthalates are another endocrine disrupting chemical. They're another synthetic estrogen. They're mm -hmm. found in 98% of people tested by the CDC. So they're all in us. But just like the pesticides can be metabolized quickly, so too can phthalates and also BPA. So those are chemicals that if you start reducing your exposure, they can dump out of your body very quickly. Um, and so phthalates are found in all of our fragranced items if they have that word fragrance in there. And the low hanging fruit is like, we don't need scented candles, we don't need the Febreze air spray or the Glade plugins or any of those things, even those like oil diffuser pots. Mm -hmm. Those are, it's all synthetic chemicals in those pots, right? And so um, those are things that we don't need 
they just, they're not really adding anything to our lives. Sure, they might make our home smell nice, but we can also achieve that through non-toxic means like essential oil diffusers and mm -hmm. things like that. Um, and so yeah, that's really what, it, yeah. And I, and I just want to make sure, every, again, everybody's listening. So when you get those plugins and you put them all over your house and or you're your so car. proud, or your car. A lot of people put them in their car. Their car. You're, you're just spewing toxins all over for your whole family. And I remember when I first learned about this, we used to have them in my medical office. And I just went around to every outlet and ripped pulled them out. all out and threw them in the trash. Um, now, when it comes to essential oils, though, I just, because they're very popular right now, yeah. and I've been using them more and more and recommending them, but it's my understanding that they can say it's a pure essential oil and have only 5% essential oil in and don't have to tell you what the other 95% is ingredients. Do you, can you speak to I that at all? I don't know very okay. much about that. What I can say okay. about essential oils is just because they're natural does not mean they're safe. Okay. So, right. you know, I think that that's just sort of a blanket assumption that we make. And there's certainly, um, you know, many essential oils that are not supposed to be used directly on the skin without a carrier oil because they can cause um, issues. Um, mm -hmm. There are, you know, some essential oils that are not ideal if you're pregnant or nursing. So we really do still have to read the fine print. Um, obviously you have pets, I have pets. Um, uh, animals can't always metabolize these chemicals in the same way that we can. So a lot of essential oils, um, especially the ones that are high in phenols and terpenes are actually very toxic to cats. So I love essential oils. I don't diffuse them in my home because I have a cat. A cat. And mm -hmm. It's just like her liver can't handle it and they can be deadly um, if they're exposed at, at too high a level. And so mm -hmm. um, everything in moderation, when we're talking about essential oils, um, because you know we we still have to be cautious. And and um, uh, here's a little interesting nugget for you: um, when we use citrus-based cleaners, and this would also be true for citrus-based essential oils um, that have this sort of specific profile of terpenes. If we live in an area that has high ozone levels, like if you live in a city that you get ozone warnings on the news that say, you know, it's poor air quality, high ozone. Um, what happens with the citrus-based cleaners is that some of the constituents of that oil will react with the ozone that's naturally present or there because of pollution or ozone generating machines in your office or home. And they create what are called secondary byproducts. And that secondary byproduct is formaldehyde, which is a carcinogen. So, um, some cities in like Los Angeles where they actually have uh, ozone warnings. I don't know if they still do this. They used to do this at one point. They would actually say, don't use citrus-based cleaners today because it cre creates formaldehyde in the air. And that's a carcinogen. So this is, again, everything has an asterisk. <laughs> Essential oils are great. Asterisk. <laughs> unless you live in this place or unless you have cats. And then you just have to be a little bit more careful. So um, I love essential oils, but I always uh, encourage people to be educated and judicious in their use. And again, I love that you gave kind of the, the pre quelled where you said, don't freak out and get overwhelmed. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, your body can clear these and, uh, you know, you've got to avoid, avoid, avoid. And so Laura's giving you tips on things you can do today uh, to avoid these. So it's not that big a deal. You don't need to freak out. Just get rid of the yeah. scented and candles and, and it doesn't yeah. have to happen mm -hmm. overnight. And if it takes you six months or a year to start this process, fine. Any step that you take to start yeah. reducing your exposure is a good step, no matter how small. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, if you feel inspired to start chucking out your Glade plugins and your scented, you know, Febreze air fresheners right. and all that stuff. Excellent. That's an amazing step. Yeah. This is also true. If anybody has respiratory issues in the home, allergies or asthma, because these can be triggers. Um, this is also true if anybody has um, children in the home that have, um, are on the autism spectrum, because those can be sensory triggers, right? So children on the autism spectrum tend to have sensory issues and they're overstimulated. And we take for granted that our laundry detergent smells, like we don't, we don't think about this stuff, but for people that have highly sensitive systems, every single one of those things as they're walking through the house can be things that can trigger 
behavioral episodes. And so let's get that stuff out of the house. It's not doing anybody any good. Yeah. So detoxing your house is probably where you want to start with. Yeah. Um, let's go back to the, the endocrine disruptor and kind of the uh, xenoestrogen and how it affects your health. So just, I know that you like to geek out on these things and just give people a little bit of an idea about how that works, how these chemicals function in your body. How, how do they get to the places they get and what they do? Well, I mean, I think that, you know, the, the short answer is, so, and so some of them behave differently, right? So we don't always know. And, and what's complicated is that the same endocrine disruptor, say BPA, can have a different effect in you than it can have a different effect in me. So for you, it might trigger um, a thyroid issue cascade, whereas for me, it might end up being a... Um, something that's going to interfere with my metabolism, right? It could be one of those obesogenic chemicals. And by the way, and I talked about this right in the beginning. Yeah. Um, so we can talk a little, little bit about yeah, this. Yeah, let's talk about um, that. Uh, phthalates mm -hmm. and BPA, so both of those chemicals and plastics and fragrances fall into this category of obesogenic chemicals. And so obesogenic chemicals are not necessarily all endocrine disruptors. It just so happens that most of them are, but they work on different um, pathways in the body. So um, uh, one of the ways that they have an effect on us in terms of our metabolic state is that they can activate, well, I'll back up. So we all know that weight gain is a side effect of medication, right? In certain medications, there's certain medications that are well established to have a side effect of weight gain. Somebody can be normal weight and get put on one of these pharmaceuticals, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's, um, even um, uh, medications like Nexium and Prevacid, but also um, antipsychotics and antidepressants mm -hmm. often have mm -hmm. these uh, side effects. And they can be of normal weight, get put on this, and within three or four months, they can you know, pack on 10, 20 pounds, 30 pounds, 40 pounds, and then spend the rest of their life trying to get it off. And so the mechanism of action in those cases with those pharmaceuticals is that those chemicals, those pharmaceutical drugs are activating um, this uh, regulator in our body, it's a PPAR gamma receptor that's responsible for, you know, kind of overseeing the, the regulation of our fat cells. And so when that receptor gets activated, uh, it sends a signal to our bodies to say, okay, well, I see you fat cell, I'm going to give you marching orders to start getting bigger. So more fat, more fat cells can, more fat can enter that cell. So you have physically larger fat cells in your body, which in and out of itself can lead to waking. Mm -hmm. um, the, if a cell is in pre-development, activation of that receptor will turn a other, what, let's say, gives marching orders to say, you go be a fat cell instead of a skin cell or a hair cell or an eyeball cell, right? Like it's telling, giving more commands out there. So you end up with more fat cells in addition to larger fat cells. And this is how those pharmaceuticals are leading to weight gain in most cases. It's mm -hmm. their activation of this receptor. Well, the bisphenol A and the phthalates also have the ability to turn on that same receptor. Mm. So we already know. So people sometimes think, oh, why would my shampoo make me fat? Right. And they think that this is like some ludicrous concept. Right. It's a concept we all already fundamentally know because we all know somebody who's experienced weight gain as a side effect of pharmaceutical. And we don't mm -hmm. think that's crazy because we've seen it happen. And so a lot of these chemicals that are these synthetic estrogens um, or that are maybe not a synthetic estrogen, but they act on this PPAR gamma receptor have this same outcome or can have the same outcome where it's changing the marching orders for our cells and we end up with more and larger fat cells. Um, the other thing that happens is a lot of these chemicals that we're exposed to are what are called lipophilic chemicals. So they're fat soluble. Mm -hmm. They love fat, they're attracted to fat and they hang out in fat. And so um, the more chemicals of these that are, that you're exposed to, they're going to go gravitate towards your adipose tissue. And if you don't have enough adipose tissue to safely store these chemicals, your body can start putting on more weight as a protective mechanism to help stop these chemicals from circulating in your body. 
right? This is a uh, fascinating and amazing defense mechanism that our body employs to help keep these things out of circulation. But the end result is waking. Right, and I love to tell people fat is not just decoration, it's a storage unit, yes. and it's a storage unit for toxins. Toxins, and you right. know, so what a lot of people, you know, everybody knows like that there's detoxes and cleanses like everywhere on <laughs> the market these days. Hold on one second. Man coming from car. <laughs> Hold on one second. At least you know they're protecting you. <laughs> Okay, you did a good job, girl. Come here. <laughs> Come here. Come. Lay down. Um, okay. okay, so, um, you know, what happens with this, this adipose tissue and this, all these toxins that are stored in us and, and this concept around, like, detoxing and cleansing and losing, losing weight, and I don't want to be flippant about those programs because they can be super powerful and they can be great first starts and steps for people to re-engage with healthy eating and all of that stuff, but you're mm -hmm. not actually detoxing. And so what happens during weight loss, and this is uh, especially true during um, accelerated weight loss. So if somebody, for example, has gastric bypass or lap band surgery and they have a highly restricted caloric intake and they have massive fat loss, those people tend to get very sick. Yes. Their hair falls out, their skin gets all white and pasty, their energy plummets, they have all of these immune system issues. And the reason why that's happening is all of those stored toxins that were in the fat are now getting dumped into the system. And your liver is like, holy crap, I can't handle all this. And so it just is floating around and making you really sick. And so this is why you know, again, it's, if we work on avoidance, then our body can sort of naturally at its own pace, start to, um, uh, eliminate some of these toxins that are in us. And then once we move towards, um, whether it's weight loss or, you know, um, even if it's not, if, if you're not like exercising for weight loss, but for muscle, muscle building, then that's going to help burn off some of that fat you want to make sure that you're really supporting your liver because your liver is the workhorse of the detox process. And if you're eating junky food and drinking alcohol and smoking and doing all this stuff and your liver's not functioning well, um, detoxing or doing weight loss, mm -hmm. any kind of uh, highly restricted caloric diet can actually, that's why people feel bad on detoxes. A lot, a lot of the time. Right, right. And especially, you know, things like they call it the master cleanse. It's so popular. Oh, no which is, you know, oh lemon goodness. juice and cayenne with maple syrup and yeah. things like that. And um, I have somebody some- with blood sugar issues, that makes me like cringe <laughs> at the idea of drinking. I'm like, where's the protein? Where's the protein? <laughs> where's the protein? And also where's the liver support for the detoxification? Yeah. And that's yeah. why in my program that I outline in my book, you know, one of the keys uh, to successful and lasting weight loss is detoxification. Absolutely. You have to do it properly. Yes. Um, so I love and what you're saying. And that's really about supporting yeah. the liver. Like, you know, I don't think that detoxing in the way that I'm talking about it, not in like a juice cleanse or a diet or a fast or something like that, but in terms of actually getting the chemicals in our bodies out is it's a, it's not a um, reactive process. It's a proactive process. So it's not, oh, I'm having all this stuff. I should do a detox. It's I'm doing detoxing every day. And your body yes. is doing detoxing every day, right? You go to the bathroom, that's mm -hmm. detoxing. You sweat, that's detoxing. Right. Um, we need to amp that up, but do it in a way that's not forced. And so we do that by avoidance, 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 and supplementation, those are the easiest ways. And only in an instance where somebody has severe, like heavy metal toxicity, for example, that somebody would move to working with a functional practitioner to doing a more advanced, provoked detox. That's not for the faint of heart, sort of medical supervision situation only in that, in that right. realm. But we, we can do so much with avoidance and, and proper support of our, of our detox. If we're not pooping, if we're not going to the bathroom, yes. like that's, you, you can't, you're not detoxing. Right. And that's if you, number one. 
Yeah, it's like, number one, and I, I had a, a woman I've known. Technically, it's number two, but we'll, well it's, it's number one. <laughs> technically, it's number two, but it's the number one thing you need yes. to do. If you're listening and you are not pooping and you are having health issues, that is the number one thing you need to do is get yes. yourself pooping every single day. And not with drugs, just with yes. fiber and yes. water and magnesium. Yeah, so, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, uh, you know, once you start making the changes around phasing plastics out and reintroducing glass as much as we can and swapping out your personal care products. And that in and of itself can be kind of daunting. Um, I have a Pinterest board, um, a couple of Pinterest boards where I pin products that I like. So if people want a shortcut, they can go there. There's lots of resources okay. online. Um, I'll put a link also for great. that. Okay. Um, um, so if people are like, ah, what shampoo do I buy? What makeup do I use? Like there are alternatives that are not made with these harmful synthetic ingredients. This wasn't true six or seven years ago. Mm -hmm. um, it was really hard to find these products, but because consumer awareness is growing at such a, a frenzied rate around chemicals in consumer products, you have all of these small comp independent companies that have really stepped forward with this mission to create amazing products that aren't harmful. And mm -hmm. so there's this, I actually can't even keep, keep up with all the products that are out there now that are totally safe and non-toxic and great to use, um, but there's so many. So um, my Pinterest board has some of them. There's lots mm -hmm. of other places um, online for that. Um, great. But yeah, just start making those changes. Mm -hmm. um, and if people really want to dive in, they can check out my classes. There's lot, like I said, there's lots of other resources online, whether it's me or somebody else. Um, there's a lot of people talking about this. And again, my focus is mm -hmm. practical avoidance and, and let's take it one step at a time. And then we can pat ourselves in the back and say, you know, now that I've phased out all my, like, I don't have, haven't had plastic for years. Like I don't think about my drinking, materials. I just grab what I have. I don't think mm -hmm. about it. It's not on my mind constantly. And I think that if we can get to that place, mm -hmm. um, we actually feel very empowered. And this is such great information. We could probably talk about this for hours and hours and hours and everybody would proceed to get overwhelmed. Yes. But I loved how you prefaced that. And I love your motto that's helping you change the things you can control so you can worry less about the things you can't. Yep. So you can tell people how they can find out more. How can they find out more about your class? Um, yeah, so my website is just lauraadler.com, L-A-R-A-A-D-L-E-R. And my, uh, the course that I was talking about, Tools for Teaching Toxicity, you can find at teachingtoxicity.com. Um, I'm on Instagram, Facebook, all those places, Pinterest. Um, you can just Google me. Um, it's L A R. -A most people add a U in there, but it makes it pretty easy to find me since I have a fairly um, unique spelled name, which you do too. So I'm sure nobody's spelling right. your, like people are like, how do I find you? Just type my name into the internet and it will be there. But yes, um, right. uh, you guys can check me out there. Follow me on Instagram, follow me on Facebook um, and reach out if you have questions. I love talking with people about this stuff and I'm happy to answer questions if people have them. Great. And I will put, um, I'm going to make a cheat sheet from the show with all of the notes that we've talked about, as well as all of the links and the links to Laura's class and her website and her Pinterest board so that it makes it easy for you. And uh, if you haven't been able to take notes, you can just download that and, and have that. Thank you so much, Laura, for joining me today. Um, I know that everybody listening and watching has learned so much. Um, they've gotten education. I always say knowledge, tools, and support is, are what people yep. need. And they have gotten just that knowledge, tools, and support so that they can have the freedom to have the health that they want and deserve and live lives that they love. So thank you so much. You are for so welcome. Joining us. You are so <laughs> welcome. I love talking about this. And thank you for introducing me to your audience. Thank you. Thank you for joining me for this episode of Her Brilliant Health Radio. Hopefully you are inspired to take action on some new information you received today. A step towards the bountiful, blissful, beautiful vitality that you deserve. If you have health topics and questions you'd like addressed, please message me on my Facebook page or visit KieranDunstonMD.com and let me know. I'd love to help. Remember to share this podcast on social media and send it to your friends and family who could benefit from it too. 
If you love the show, please go right now to iTunes, write a review, and make sure to subscribe to the podcast so you'll be the first to know when future episodes are available. Thank you again for joining me. And remember, achieving optimal health isn't magic, it's science.